Welcome to Here Come the Irish. I'm Michael Owens. Here on this Friday afternoon, some of you guys will be watching me here live, others will be this afternoon or uh, Saturday. Irish are 6-0. and uh, It falls finally here, here in Indianapolis. I'm sure it's just as cold, if not colder, in South Bend. It'll probably be chilly for tomorrow's game. I'm not sure the exact temperature. Uh, Matthew Southwood will not be joining me this week. He is in Florida, so he's on vacation. So hopefully he'll be back here in a few weeks when Notre Dame takes on Navy in a couple weeks. Obviously, we got the bye next week. A uh, great show in store for you today. Uh, if you guys have been following my feed, we'll be interviewing Cam McDaniel here in just a minute. Recapping the Notre Dame-Virginia Tech game, uh, previewing the Notre Dame-Pittsburgh game, and giving you all the predictions for the big game this week. I do have an upset and think Notre Dame will may possibly move up a spot after it's all said and done. Before I call Cam, I'm just going to give you a quick uh, background uh, as his, his uh, football career. He was a Notre Dame running back from 2011 to 2014. Part of the 2012 undefeated regular season team will be touching on uh, a lot of those games throughout that year. I'm interested to see what he has to say about it. Um, over 1,100 yards rushing with uh, eight touchdowns on the ground. He also had 17 receptions for 151 yards. Um, he did have a career in the Canadian Football League from 2016 to 2017. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to try to see if I can get him on here. Just try to get this phone figured out real quick, and we'll give him a call. All right, here we go. Hey Cam, what's up? This is Mike Loans with Here Come the Irish. How are you doing today? Michael, good to hear from you, man. I'm doing well. Well, um, I've got a lot of questions for you. I'm just going to kind of start right off the top with um, why did you pick Notre Dame um, over other schools that you were looking at? Yeah, yeah. So, um, man, that was an interesting process, the whole recruiting. The whole recruiting game is always an interesting process, and it's even changed so much since I've, you know, since I've gone through what I've I've been through. My little brother just committed to SMU recently, so I've kind of like seen what he's been doing. But uh, but yeah, for me, uh, I just I just made it a priority, you know, from the beginning of my recruiting process, to just pray, you know, that God would just make a way and He would open every door that needed to be opened and close every door that needed to be closed. And man, that's that's exactly what happened. Notre Dame wasn't necessarily like I never had a I didn't have dreams or aspirations to go to Notre Dame, but when you know Coach Kelly flew down and offered me, I just felt from the Holy Spirit that that was exactly where I was supposed to be, and uh, and it was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, like you said, recruiting's definitely changed today with the social media getting bigger every every year. And um, congratulations on your brother. Actually, I said I was going to have you on the show, and I saw someone comment that uh, yeah. um, about your brother and stuff. I just noticed too that I looked up that he committed to SMU. So congrats to that. Um, but yeah, the whole process, yeah. uh, sounds like you're kind of more of a little underdog story, which Notre Dame's had a lot recently with Joe Schmidt or Chris Fink, some of these guys, uh, coming here, maybe not like five stars or whatever, um, and come in there and prove, get playing time and prove themselves. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The, the underdog story has been kind of a common theme throughout my career. So I'm pretty, pretty used to that. Um, you know, if you, uh, <laughs> just kind of we live in a world where you know the world's always watching and the thing is is no matter no matter what unfortunately you know aspects of the world there's just judgment and um in this game there's particular uh, stereotypes and, and cliches and judgment that uh you know sometimes goes up dead but you know it is what it is and uh being a white running back is not really a thing that <laughs> yeah. you see every day and yeah it doesn't mean that like doesn't mean that it can't happen obviously and be successful at it there's uh there's plenty of people or i mean it goes the other it goes the other way too all time uh people felt that way uh, about quarterbacks as well with african americans and, and like that that uh that obviously was a faulty faulty way of thinking about things and, and so it's just it's just cool to see as a society that we're moving past these ridiculous stereotypes you know that that race, race, ethnicity, uh, that uh, your belief system, whatever, 
like doesn't doesn't really factor into really who you are as a player. Even even the the aspects of your you know your size, your weight, your speed, whatever. Yeah. Um, you know one of the one of the reasons I love watching um, you know Ian Book play is because man, I just, I just feel like he's a gamer, man. He's just got intangibles and um, everything. I, I never really met Brandon Wimbush, but. Um, I've heard absolutely incredible things from about him from uh, Joe Schmidt, who's still one of my best friends today. And uh, you know the thing, the thing that uh, Ian has really like done this year, and I've, like how he's been able to solidify, you know, now his spot as a starter is uh, it's really just coming in and, and and seizing the opportunity that he was given, and, and and demonstrating those intangibles that are hard to measure until you're really in the game, like. You don't, you don't see it in practice. You don't see it in practice. You may not see it, you know, just uh, in the context of where he was playing at high school or whatever. But, you know, when he gets on that stage, uh, there's just something about his presence that carries the team forward. And, and that's kind of, like, I always kind of had that perspective about myself. You know, I always that thought that even beyond, you know, just my talent, I really thought that there were certain – um, people that you know, brought our team together in such a way that allowed us to get wins. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on, on a lot of those topics. Um, I look at Baker Mayfield, prime example that he was uh, he had to transfer and he was a uh, walk on. And we have other. I mean, there's so many examples yep. throughout sports. Uh, Tom Brady getting drafted so far down the line, and uh, yeah, like you said, man, there's yep. just some guys. Even Brandon Wimbush, not to knock on him or anything, like he was the fourth um, overall quarterback, like out of his recruiting class, I believe, somewhere around there. And Ian Book, I think he was like maybe like a three star. or – even my one of my best friends said that he knows some guy who's out there in California. He's like, yeah, Ian Book was even like the best quarterback in our conference in high school. So it's um, playing at different levels and um, maturing and hitting the weight room and heart and stuff and um, football IQ. A lot of that stuff's hard to measure until you actually get out there. Yeah, it is, and, and we we tend to overlook that, you know, as uh, as coaches. I mean, sometimes you know, a coach doesn't necessarily see those things right away and some you know some coaches definitely have a knack for seeing those things and I have to I gotta hand it to Brian Kelly because you know I believe that that's one of the things that uh, he's really I think he's gifted at that I think he's gifted at seeing uh, seeing intangibles in players and I, I think that's why he recruited me at the end of the day like the heart and the intention um, of him recruiting me was that you know he didn't I, I didn't necessarily have just all the I stats in high school, but not just like the best stats in the world. Yeah. You know, when you watch my film, I felt like I was a dynamic player, but at the same time, a lot of people would say, oh, he's, you know, undersized or not fast enough or whatever, blah, 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 blah. But I think um, what makes, what makes, uh, you know, a coach, a coach really a great coach is when he's able to see those those intangibles and begin to, you know, see, man, this game is so much more than, you know, just the measurables. It's about the, those things, uh, almost the, the metaphysics of the game, if you will. <laughs> the yeah. Things that are more in the, more that, more that are seen like as the game is played out and kind of like the Joe Montana factor. Absolutely. And, yeah. um, and I think we're, I think we're kind of getting back to the heart of that in a lot of ways. And I think especially Notre Dame nation is, is, is getting a, a, a really like a taste of that um, right now. As you, you know, we look at some of the the guys on our team. Not just Ian Book. You know, you got your Chris. Like you got a guy like Chris Fink. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. You got uh, even even. I mean, one of my best friends, Drew Tranquil, who's now like, I mean, he is an absolute just force on the field to be reckoned with. Uh, Alohi Gilman. Uh, like, <laughs> yeah. Just, it is. I mean, we got we got guys like that all around, and. Um, and I just think I think that's really fun. I think that's a fun part of the game. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, some sometimes I'll see that the Notre Dame uh, guys a guy commit maybe a three star or whatever. In the past, I used to be like, why are we not getting these four or five stars? But I mean, what per- Kelly's done these last um, couple ye- several years, even this whole time there. I mean, the coaches they know what they're doing, they know what to look for, and um, a lot of these guys like you in particular too pan out to be great um, players for Notre Dame, which is um, awesome. They know what they're doing. Yeah, I would say that um, in that regard, it's definitely, definitely something where Coach Kelly's proven himself um, to be, you know, 
he's, he's definitely got a knack for that, and I, I respect him. I respect him because he, he was one of those guys that uh, quote unquote took a chance on me, <laughs> even though yeah. you know I thought I could play anywhere in the nation, and I think he really respected that about me. And that's usually the chip on the shoulder that a lot of these guys have that are you know your three star underrated you know walk on players. Like I mean even Joe, like Joe Schmidt was one of those guys that you know being a walk on. I mean talk about talk about an underdog story. I mean I can't wait till they make a movie about that kid one day. Because, yeah. Um, you know it's just. And, and I think Malcolm Gladwell actually uh, has a book based off of this principle, and it's really an intriguing principle. Essentially, you know, his whole the whole premise of his book, or the whole uh, the synopsis of his book, I, I believe, was that David ended up having a advantage over to, over Goliath, actually being the underdog. And um, I actually I think that that's true based off mindset. Sometimes it's not always true. Um, you got your Cam Newtons, you got your LeBron James of the yeah. world that you know they just go out and just dominate no matter what. Um, but I mean, but you got to give them credit too because it's it, again it's a mindset thing. Yeah, it, it all it's always it always goes back to mindset, man. Like every time, and um, no what no matter whether you are you know a Joe Montana or you are. A LeBron James, um, those guys are, you know, they will go down in history as, you know, two of the greatest in their sport um, based off of their mindset. It's their mindset that, that has carried them. Because even if we look at LeBron, and this is why I have to give LeBron credit, and I know I'm <laughs> like, this, oh, is no. complete rabbit, <laughs> this is a complete rabbit trail in a way. But, you know, even though he does have all that talent, you know, we've seen – you know, you see guys all the time that look the part, but, you know, don't play the part. And LeBron's one of those guys that has come come in year in and year out. And, and you know, he, man, he plays the part. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, complete, complete, uh, sorry, there, sorry. No, it's all good, man. Love, love talking. We can talk on here for hours, but, um, uh, yeah, I do have several more questions and other topics we can touch on um, before, before I move on there, though. Um, kind of on a personal note, I mean, I I only weighed 150 pounds my senior year of high school, and I benched like 170 pounds, but I still, um, through baseball IQ and working on my craft and stuff, I was able to play college baseball. So, I mean, I'm not a college football, D1 college football player like you are or any, some of these other guys, but um, I was able to be a college athlete just from determination like you, you were talking about right there. So, um, to move yeah. on, some other, some other topics, a lot of good questions I want to ask you, see your thoughts on. Um, what was your favorite part about being a Notre Dame uh, player, maybe running out of the tunnel or favorite spot on campus? Gotcha. Man, there's so many parts about Notre Dame that are just magical, man. Uh, it's just a special place. Um, and I've said this, I've said this uh, for years, but really there's just a spirit of excellence on the place, and, and that's why it produces the people that it produces. And um, you get, you know, when you, when you go to Notre Dame, you know, you're – you're partnering with a legacy. And, um, and so honestly, <laughs> just, I'm not trying to like sound like, like cliche or anything, but it was just the day to day of just being on campus. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And just you know, sometimes, sometimes I'd just be walking on campus. And I'm like, man, the, the shoe, like the, the feet that have tread this same ground yeah. that I tread on, like on the day to day, is just crazy to think about. Um, the history and the legacy running out. I mean, obviously running out of the tunnel, touching the play, like the champion today sign. I mean, it's just, it's, it really is special. You can't like, you really can't uh, put words to it in a way because it's, there's this nostalgia. Even when I go back, like every time I just experience that nostalgia of just, wow, you know, I was, I'm a piece of this history now and I forever will be. And I'm and, sure, um, I'm sure college is like, I, I, go ahead. No, 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 that's, that's that's it. That's that's um, yeah. that's why you know I love I loved it and I still love it today. I was gonna say um, I'm sure college was like this for you, but for me, man, it just flew by. Like you, it's hard to soak in all those memories, and college goes by twice as fast as high school did. Yeah, exactly. I can't even believe that I've been out you know longer than I was in now. That's that's a weird thing. That's a weird thing. Well, I guess not yet, but it feels like it. I mean, I've I've been out as long as I've. Uh, been in now, which is crazy. I mean, it feels like literally yesterday that I was um, I was walking on campus, and uh, that's you know that was in 2011, so seven years ago, man. 
It's crazy. And crazy, you're talking about uh, Drew Tranquil. He graduated high school here in Indiana the same uh, the same year I did, 2013, and he's still playing. He's been it seems like he's been there forever. Man, he has. And um, I mean, I mean, obviously those two unfortunate ACL, you know, seizing ending injuries, but. Uh, you want to talk about strong mindset, man. You're not going to get any stronger than that kid's will. And, um, gosh, I, I respect the heck out of that, that kid. He, he will be, he will forever be family to me. Um, you know, we, we talk often. Um, I was on campus. I was on campus, uh, for the stand for the Stanford game. And we got to go have breakfast together. Him and his wife, Jackie met with me and, and, and my wife and my two little girls and, um, man, it was just great catching up with those guys and spending time with them. And, and he's just, you know, he's the epitome of like what, you know, what a Notre Dame man should exemplify, you know, he's just got, he's got the will, he's got the character. He just honors his teammates so well. Um, I mean, that's to me, that's why, you know, even beyond, I'm going to give, you know, you got to give the coaching staff credit. You got to give, uh, you know, just, timing, right place, right time, all of that stuff. But you can't – the reason why Notre Dame is where they're at right now, I, I, I'm telling you, right now, Drew Tranquil is a huge part of that, like a huge part of that. And um, his leadership skills are just invaluable, man, invaluable. Whoever – whoever, whatever NFL team can see those intangibles on that guy, um, they're going to they're gonna get a, uh, a great – a great player in their organization. That's going to, that's going to really add value to their squad. Um, I'm, I'm kind of got a, a baseball background, obviously um, huge Notre Dame fan fall college football relentlessly. Um, but the thing I like to see in sports is, is stuff that um, you can control. Like there's talent and that happens, but like we've been talking about this whole show last weekend against Notre, uh, Notre Dame, Virginia tech, Khalid Kareem, misses the sack, then he gets up, dives all out to force a fumble that Julian Love picks up and scores for a touchdown. That stuff is just pure heart right there, and that's what I absolutely love. And I think that uh, I think Drew Tranquil yeah. is even playing with maybe a broken hand or a, a something along those lines, too, and he's he's a gamer. He's still yeah. in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he is. And, you know, that's – yep, I could go on about that kid all day. But, you know, the cool thing is, is from even what I hear about him is, is that uh, – you know, that team, that team's full of guys that, you know, are high character. And he really, just talking to him even, you know, over breakfast and talking to him about the team, talking to him about the pulse of the team. And, and he, you could just see his confidence in his team. And that's, man, that's uh, when, when a leader starts to talk about their team in that way. And you can, you can not only, like, you, you I mean, you hear what they say, but then you can see it in their eyes. You can see the belief. And, and that's uh, that's just a fun place to be, man. Everybody wants to play for a football team. That I mean, it's and it's it's hard these days, man, because it's so competitive and it's so, you know, it's such a, it can be so businesslike. It can be so cutthroat to have a team that you're like, man, we're gonna win this game because everybody I know everybody on this team has the confidence that we're gonna go out and beat this team, and. And that's, that's a hard place to get to as a football team, but from what Drew, you know, has been telling me, um, I feel like that's that's the pulse of that locker room, and, and that's why you're seeing, you know, you're seeing what you're seeing so far this year. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, over the years, you can just tell kind of whenever they interview players or interview Kelly, I can just tell by the tone. And this year, man, they got the tone. We're going to go there and kick their butt. And you can just tell that their confidence in the uh, in the press conference and whenever they talk to the players and stuff like that, you can just tell by how they're talking that they're confident. And you, they, they know they're going to go out there and kick some butt. Yep. Yep. Oh, yep uh, that, the, confidence, the confidence tells you everything, man. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Hey, um, we got I got a ton of questions to ask you here. Let's uh, dive into that 2012 season. If you still if you have uh, you have time to be on here for the next maybe like 20, 30 minutes, if we keep going. Sure, man. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. See go. how long it takes. All right. Okay, the 2012 season. Some games that stick out to me. Feel free to chime in on any ones you want. But that Stanford game, man, that was uh, one of the best games I've ever been to as a fan, man. That was awesome. What What were your thoughts on that game? Oh man, I mean, just electric. <laughs> It's just, yeah, it's one of those games that I'll never forget. I mean, that goal line stand is just, um, 
it's just why that's why you play the game, man. You play the game for moments like that to be a part of 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 snapshots in history. Uh, and that was one of those. That was one of those moments. Um, and uh, when I get together with teammates that were also, you know, that were a part of that uh, that experience with me, it just uh, again, it brings back that nostalgia. It brings back the real, the real joy, you know, because happiness is one of those things. Like you experience happiness after every game. You know, winning yeah. is tough. Yeah. It's hard, and you know, you got to like have fulfillment in winning. But, but those moments are pure joy, you know. And joy, joy lasts forever. Like it's, it's a, it's just a whole nother level of fulfillment. You know, happiness. I, I, I feel like is more of an emotion that's more surface, and joy is this. It's this, uh, man. Again, it's more like, <laughs> yeah, more like yeah. an intangible. It's a, yeah, it's an, it's an, it's a terminology that's intangible because it, it really carries such weight to it. I don't want to say, um, obviously, with like religion and family and stuff like that, those are some of the best days of my life. But that I wasn't on the field that day, but I was in the stands. But that was truly from college game day to going to overtime to the rain to getting go on the field. That was one of the best days of my life when you guys won when uh, you guys won that game. That was freaking awesome for me. I know the fans were that game and the game a couple weeks ago against Stanford. The two loudest games I've been to twenty at Notre Dame Stadium. And those are two loudest ones I've been to. And it was just it was awesome that game. Yeah. I, I'm really, uh, I was really pleased with our fan base. Um, this, I mean, even I went to Georgia last year and went to Stanford this year, and I really just feel like consistently our fan base is like really getting, we're starting to become that place to go to where you just don't want to play at Notre Dame because we got our, no, I mean, we're reaching noise levels that I feel like we weren't reaching even when I, I mean, at that Stanford game, yes, we definitely had it, but I feel like even more on a more consistent basis, Notre Dame's kind of starting to get that home field advantage, uh, not just the the history and the legacy and all that, but the like the kind of gritty, tough. Um, we're still like our our fans are still some of the best in the nation, and we're like we honor our like our guests. I mean, for the most part, like our guys are going to honor the people, the the other opponent coming in, which I've always loved that. But I love. I love them just being a part of the game because it's an extension of, it's an extension of our team. You know, it's an extension of, of it's Notre Dame nation. And, and it really is like, it helps. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. helps the team win. Like it helps the team win football games when it's hard for the other team to communicate. Like any coach is going to tell you communication is, is, is at the top of the priority list for a team. And, when you make it difficult on the other team uh, to come in there and and to communicate to one another, um, that's invaluable. Uh, that's invaluable for you know that's invaluable for the Notre Dame football team even finishing this year. Because um, I'm just going to kind of go off on one other tangent real quick. But, no, no problem. Uh, you know, yeah, like we're talking about undefeated seasons and everybody's really like hyped up. And man, I am. I'm excited. I I think this team has. I think that this team has the potential to be, you know, that football team. But, you know, we can't. And I and I think the guys understand this, but I want the I want the fans to understand this too. That we can't overlook. You can't overlook a pit. Like you just can't. You can't overlook. I mean, look at two thousand the two thousand twelve season. We'll just we'll just rewind to that real quick. You can't Absolutely. overlook pit. You can't you can't overlook anybody. Yeah. Virginia Tech. <laughs> Virginia Tech will tell you that. Yeah. You can't overlook Old Dominion. You just you just can't do it in college football because you never know. You have to go out and play the game. You have to have an honor like for your opponent every week that says, "Hey, we're here to play, and you're going to get our best um, until the final whistle." And um, and part of that is with the crowd, man. If we can continue to get that experience with the crowd, um, you're just. I feel like you're just going to see. First of all, like recruits notice that stuff. Yeah. Uh, um, you know the the other teams notice that stuff, and, 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 it, and there's an intimidation factor to it. There's just so many other factors that, you know, stewarding that home field advantage environment, um, man, it's it's an awesome thing, and it's it it really is an honor as a fan to know that you're part of that. Yeah, building off a lot of things that you said. Um, 
uh, running a lot of these Notre Dame accounts. So I got like 30,000 followers. Um, it kind of was a grassroots campaign to get that green out against Mission. We got started and ended up becoming a huge thing. I think yep. um, things like that in the future can definitely help. I think that the Jumbotrons helped when they um, they played that video against the Stanford game. I think they played against Michigan uh, referring to uh, games yep. where to get the crowd noise that there was a bunch of false starts in the 80s when uh, they're playing Michigan. So uh, And then just putting on the screen, stand up. Like, Obviously, when you play against Ball State and stuff, they're not as loud. But the big games, I think it's yeah, that that Notre Dame Stanford game a couple weeks ago was the loudest game I had ever been to. I just think starting like that would be huge. And also, um, I think it was funny if you saw that Notre Dame Virginia Tech game last week. That I think Virginia Tech had like four or five false starts and they were at home. That was that was pretty hilarious to me. And then uh, one last thing, you're talking about Pitt, obviously prime example 2012. But even last year, they beat Miami at home, who might not have been as good. Um, as we thought, but also uh, two years ago, in 2016, when Clemson beat Alabama for the national title, Pitt went on the road to Clemson and upset them. So I don't think Notre Dame can afford to, uh, for a loss this year. So, And after all these years of Brian Kelly being there, I think he's definitely uh, got this team fired up to not look past the Pittsburgh team. Yeah. Yeah, I think the players, I think the players are locked in. I mean, even looking at some of the comments from the players this week, I mean – you know you're gonna you're gonna get that, but um, I mean usually it's the players that really have that understanding again, and you know they're gonna say what they're supposed to say because everybody <laughs> everybody's yeah. gonna say what they're supposed to say this in this day and age. Everybody's got a PR guy back there that's able to help you know navigate the conversation and tell them what you know they're supposed to say and all that stuff. But you know what I feel like is like that difference just going back to the look and the eye. You know, it's just you can't you can't get past that, man. You can't get past um, the the confidence and the swag that these guys seem to carry with them right now. And um, man, it, it makes it exciting. It makes it exciting as alumni. It makes it exciting as a fan, um, former player to you know see see those guys carrying that right now. And um, just excited to see how the rest of the year plays out for them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, since we're touching on Pittsburgh, um, back to that 2012 season, what were you thinking when um, Pitt lined up for that uh, field goal and the, the bad snap kind of threw the kicker off? What was your guys' thoughts before that happened? Oh, man. You're just like, honestly, uh, I'm pretty charismatic, so I was just sitting over there praying in tongues. So I was just, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I might get in trouble for saying that, but I got <laughs> I was sitting over there just praying in the spirit, just like, Lord, please, no, not <laughs> not this time. And right now, this comes down to this, and right before we're, you know, our last home game, you know, of the season, and we're playing Pittsburgh, and I, it was just just that gut drop kind of moment. And so, you know, at that point, it's kind of, I mean, at my, I was on the sideline, so, you know, it was out of my hands, but, um, but man talk about you mean again that's one of those memories that's like etched in my mind forever because um i think that was kind of a wake-up call for our guys in a lot of ways and helped us going into that u.s that usc game the next week just to make sure like hey you know we got to stay focused to the very end because there's so much hype so much hype around all the manti stuff uh you know he, he was you know a heisman candidate there's so much hype around um, you know, us playing Alabama and what that was going to, or if we were even going to play Alabama and who we were going to play in the national show, everybody was talking outside of the realm of us. They were talking about those things. And, you know, I know you guys are going to, you guys as media are always going to talk about those, that stuff, but it's kind of like for the players and for us, it, it, I mean, that is a, it's almost like the temptation to start like letting your mind you know, wander there and, and, and losing focus of, you know, the here and now. Because the, the, the cool thing about every it's every team's goal at the beginning of the year, every, like, every, you know, team in FBS is saying, okay, national championship or conference championship. But they're looking at, you know, the end of the season, that's the goal, you know, to win, to win games and win them all. Yeah. Um, but – and that's a good thing to have, but you have to have like that that long term vision that like you see it in the horizon, but it's the short term vision of what's here and now. I think Lou Holtz is the one that came up with the acronym of WIN, which which is uh, what's important now. And um, and I used to use that all the time, just as a as a player, even when I was training, you know, for the NFL. But in games, you know, 
when when things would happen or the momentum swings the other way, which, you know, it's football. That's always going to happen. Even when we play, like, teams that, you know, you should beat. Sometimes, you know, it's just – it's just the circumstances and everything like that, and you've got to, you've got to be able to step back and get in the right mindset again, and 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 say, okay, what's important now? And then the team, that's the difference. Is like the team. So there's the personal ego that has to has to recognize that, and then the team, the team ego has to recognize that and say, okay, it's time to regroup, refocus. This is who we are. This is our identity. Let's step back into that and take care of business. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it definitely takes a, a strong-willed uh, team and uh, players after you just beat a Notre Dame, you beat a Stanford team, uh, then went on the road at Virginia Tech, and then I think they had finals this week and got a bye week the next week. So definitely focusing for uh, focusing for this pit game is going to be um, take a lot of strong will for these guys. Yep. Um, touch, yep. Touching on that 2012 season, let's move uh, to one of the, the other big games, the uh, uh, game at Oklahoma. If you could touch on uh, what it was like to go into Norman and uh, win that game. Oh, man, that was a huge moment for me, even personally, just because I grew up a Texas Longhorn fan, so I already hated – I already had plenty <laughs> of reason to hate OU. And um, so kind of always grew up, you know, <laughs> always despising OU. And so to go to Norman and play at Norman and go beat them at home was just – that was fun, man. That was uh, – uh, that was awesome. I actually, I, I got the game ball that game too. So it was a really special, that was a special game for me. Oh, is that right? I did not, I did not recall that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I was mainly, I mean, mainly a contributor on special teams during 2012 season. I had, you know, some moments where I was able to come in. I mean, we had, we had Sierra Wood and Theo Riddick and, yeah. um, and then George, George was kind of our change of pace home run guy. And, uh, and so, you know, they stayed healthy all season, and and um, so we had a pretty pretty solid lineup. And uh, and I was, you know, I I I had some great moments on special teams, but that night in particular, um, I had some really some really great opportunities on special teams, and our our guys just came to play. The energy was incredible, um, and man, we just we just uh, it was just one of those moments as a team to where we knew, okay, like we're going to show everybody in the nation tonight that we're for real. And uh, I think that was kind of the turning point in our season where everybody was like, okay, Notre Dame's back. This is kind of like how now everybody's, you know, started to really, really buy into that after the Stanford, Stanford game. And after the Virginia tech games, everybody's like, okay, Notre Dame's back. Like, and you know, we have those moments every now and then. Um, But this, this was that one of those really legit moments, and um, uh, gosh, it was awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think um, everybody on College Game Day, if I recall, probably picked against you guys, and even up until then, you guys, uh, the whole 21st century, like the last decade up until that, there really hadn't been a dominant Notre Dame team. It had been a while, and that was kind of the the. Uh, I knew if Notre Dame went, uh, you guys won that game, we were definitely um, a legit team. And it's funny, um, I haven't had a lot of people that I've asked to be on my show in a while. <laughs> But a couple of years back, I asked Mike Mike Golick Jr. and he talked about his favorite moment of that season was a key block he had against uh, Sierra Wood for that long run. So that's pretty cool. You guys both talking about that? Yeah, I remember that play, that power play. So that was uh, <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, that was awesome. How about that? You kind of already touched on a little bit that uh, USC game when you guys went all the way out to uh, Southern California. I know they definitely wanted to ruin our chances of going to the national championship game, but just talk me through that going on the road and coming out there with the win. I know they had a big goal line stand, and I know there's a lot of Notre Dame fans out there in uh, Southern California as well. Sure. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's just I – mean, USC, Notre Dame, um, we can't say enough about it, right? And that's why even as we talk about an undefeated season and all that stuff, like for me, I'm like, okay, well, we still got to play. <laughs> we still yeah, play USC. Yeah. Like that's a rivalry game and you never know what's going to happen. And so going into that game, I just felt we were just laser focused. We we're on a mission. We knew like, Hey, th- these are the only, they stand between us and what, like, and where we want to go, where, I mean, where we have like said, we were going to go from the beginning. We fought through all this adversity so far. We survived, you know, that pit game, that scare. We're not letting these guys, um, you know, take this opportunity from us. And so uh, I just really feel like that overall 
the team that night, the energy was just very, there was just, just there's a very expect to win um, mindset that was contagious with the team. And everybody kind of knew, you know, we're coming in here to take care of business and we're going to win this game for each other. Yeah, absolutely. If you guys are uh, watching this, I'm interviewing uh, former Notre Dame running back Cam McDaniel. Um, and that's why I'm kind of confident for this Notre Dame team. If Notre Dame can get to 11 and 0, I don't think I don't think anything's going to stop them from beating USC that 12th game. I think they'll be so determined, like you just said. Um, obviously, not predicting them to automatically win, but it's a huge game. But the fact that it's, it'll be the last game of the year for us if we go 11 and 0 to go in the playoffs, and like you said, that mindset, I don't th- it's going to be really hard to stop them this year if they go to USC 11 and 0. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay. Um, let's see what else I got on here. Oh, no, we talked about a lot of games at home and stuff. Um, what is your the loudest Notre Dame game you've ever been to on the road? Yeah, that's pretty easy. It's Michigan. Yeah, the big house is the big house, is the big house man. Um, one of the greatest one of the greatest atmospheres in college football. You just, uh, it's, uh, I know that, I know that Notre Dame Nation is definitely not a fan of the Michigan Wolverines, but you know they they have uh, they've got a home field advantage that's real, and so that's kind of you know what we've always preached. To, I think our our fans too is like that's the atmosphere that we want to continue to create. Now I will say that our fans are much <laughs> much classier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, my even the disrespect that my family got in those stands was. Uh, I mean, I know that you're going to find that anywhere, including Notre Dame. But overall, like, man, uh, I love the, the culture of honor that Notre Dame has. And even the fan base really displays um, to, you know, our away teams. And, and so, man, if we can keep that culture of honor and then bring the energy level of, you know, some of these, you know, the LSUs, the, the, uh, the Michigans, the Ohio States, the, even like the Wisconsins. And, I mean, those – Yeah. Uh, like having that type of energy, and I'm not taking away from our energy because, again, like you said, that that Stanford game was real, man. That was live. Absolutely, so yeah. I think we're making that. I think we're. I think we're like getting to that that place to where, man, our, um, you know, our atmosphere is a real like. It's, you can feel the energy in the air. It's like tangible, and um, and so I think I think we're getting there. And um, but yeah, just to answer your question, that that would be the place for me where I'd say was the most electric atmosphere. And uh, we had uh, Johnny Romano on, who was a leprechaun while you were at Notre Dame. I uh, had him on a couple of weeks ago and asked him the same yeah. question. That was his answer. Actually, um, I've already have a book for next year. I haven't got the tickets yet, but I'm 100% going. Uh, me and my dad coming from Indianapolis up to yeah. Ann Arbor. That's definitely on the bucket list to watch Notre Dame play there. Um, I know they probably won't treat us. Yep. And I, I saw a, a Notre Dame fan say the other day, hey, Michigan fans, when they came to South Bend, they were awesome. I'm like, that's easy to be. They're they're on the road. They're not talking uh, anything to Notre Dame fans. But next year, I know I'll probably get stuff thrown at me and all kinds of stuff sa- said to me, which is kind of a joke because when I've been to several uh, Michigan games at Notre Dame and I haven't said anything to them. So, But it's on my bucket list for next year. I'm, I'm really excited. Hopefully, uh, Notre Dame can um, come out of there with the wing because they haven't done it in a while. But I can't, I'm excited for that game next year. It's on my road bucket list. Yeah, yeah, no, it um, it is a great bucket list, um, great bucket list place to go. That's for sure. So you'll really enjoy that, and uh, and uh, you'll enjoy that victory that we get to, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm about to ask you for your favorite uh, Notre Dame memory, but I can remember my favorite play that you were in. It was um, 2013. Notre Dame at Purdue. Yep. Um, I was in the back of the end zone, second row up, uh, really good seats. It was like a one yard run. Um, you just went right through everybody. And then I was watching the video again, and I was just, it's funny, I just mentioned Johnny Romano, the former Notre Dame leprechaun. You shake his hand right for, right after you score, too. So that was probably my favorite memory um, as, as a Notre Dame fan. I even told my dad um, a couple days ago I was going to have you on the show. He's like, oh, yeah, that, that running back who scored right in front of us at the Purdue game. So that's yeah, definitely a lasting memory for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, for for me personally. That was definitely a defining moment in my career. Um, I was uh, two th- two thousand thirteen. I started out as a third string running back, um, and you know that was one of the games where I kind of solidified myself as you know a guy that you know the 
that that we could depend on and um and it was an opportunity for me to to go in and and um and, and make plays and i felt like uh you know i got i got an opportunity as as an individual to come and show the team like hey um you know i'm here for you guys this is it was one of those games to where we should have been winning and we knew we should have been winning and and the energy just seemed something just seemed off and um and i was mad man i was just <laughs> yeah. I was angry. I'm a super competitive guy. <laughs> so I, I was just like, you know what? Like I'm going to, my, I was actually yelling on the sidelines and, and, and kind of, I was pretty animated that game. And, you know, I think, I think it was coach Kelly probably that maybe saw that. And he said, you know what, put Cam in the game. And, uh, and so they did. And, and I just wanted to make a point based off of the way that I ran the football that, you know, we were going to win that night, no matter what, even if it had to be scrappy or, you know, didn't look didn't look as pretty as everybody else wanted it to be. Um, that we were going to win, and so I think that was actually a game to where I had. Uh, I think I still hold a record at Notre Dame for like most consecutive carries uh, in a row. I had 11, I believe, that game to close out the uh, to just kind of run the time off the clock. Um, so that was yeah for me. That was one of those moments that uh, was a really special moment. Yeah, that that's awesome. I uh, produced probably my least favorite school, which I'm not going to get into. But just being on the road, and I know there's there was a ton of Notre Dame fans there and stuff. But that was a that was an awesome night for me. Winning at their house, they're kind of remind me of like Purdue and Pittsburgh. They always they always seem to play us tough. But yeah, that that uh, rushing touchdown right there. I, I was wondering if we were ever going to score. Then he scored that rushing touchdown. The thing was, Devaris Daniels had like a 70 plus yard uh, reception, and then um, uh, Bennett Jackson with the pick six kind of sealed it for. Her. But that was an awesome night to be a Notre Dame fan. Yeah, again, that was that was a great moment. I uh, I really enjoy that, and I can look back uh, at my career personally and even say that was definitely one of my favorite my favorite uh, my favorite memories. And then um, a, f- a year later, uh, the 2014 game against Michigan. I was just watching a highlight of that too, and you can hear on the TV your pads pop. It was like the first touchdown of the game. It was like a two or three yard run, maybe less than that. But you hit two Michigan defenders, man. You can hear your pads pop, and you just they just bounce right off of you. How, what was that like? <laughs> man, that was one of those games. That was one of those games, uh, man. That that year, that 2000. 2000- 13 year uh, or 2014 year I'm sorry um, that was one of those years to where I felt like we had a lot of the intangibles that even even this team has I know that's arguable like anybody they have their own opinion that was my senior year you know I was a yeah. captain like and man we had a squad um, our biggest detriment that year was losing Joe Schmidt and when we lost Joe Schmidt uh, with coach Van Gorder's defense it just, you know, we, we, we had to put a less experienced player in. I think, I, you know, I think uh, Niles Morgan had to go in and fill in Joe's spot. And that was just big shoes to fill, to fill with, you know, how, how uh, aggressive and complicated that Van Gorder defense really was. But, I mean, if everybody remembers beforehand, <laughs> we were undefeated basically because we did beat FSU. And I know that – that yeah. was one of the things that we talked about addressing later. Yeah, we beat those guys, and they they stole the game from us. But man, you just think about that season. We, I mean, I think we ended up losing like five in a row after that Navy game, and um, like four or five in a row, something like that. And uh, but all of those games were so close. Like Arizona State, who was number six in the nation yeah. at the time, we go in on the road there. We go down at halftime. And then, you know, we come – I mean, that was actually one of uh, Malik's first shots to, to, to show what he could do. And um, me and Malik were in, uh, you know, the second half, and we almost came back and won that game. Yeah, yeah, I remember and, that. Uh, and, and so the course of that season could have been tremendously different. And, and you even see, like, you know, we beat a really good LSU football team in that bowl game. And um, – and so we had we had quite quite a team that year. I think that we had the potential to be a a bowl a bowl contending team actually, and and this it was just you know some of the injury thing you know especially with Joe Schmidt that was definitely our biggest that was our biggest loss of the season as a team. Um, 
because, you know, what he brought, that, especially that year with that defense, was just so invaluable. Yeah, and the, you're, yeah, you're being humble about that season, too. There was the injuries, and I, I really think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that Florida State game uh, might have kind of been a shot in the, the uh, chest when, once that happened. What's kind of, That was the next question I was going to ask you um, before I let you speak. Uh, I personally think that, that that call was one of the worst calls I've ever seen. I, I believe that you guys ran that play er, earlier yeah. in the game a few times. And then Clemson won the national championship against Alabama on the exact same play. But, yeah, the last seconds of the game, Notre Dame scores a game-winning touchdown. I believe it was it uh, Corey Robinson at Florida State, and they call it back for um, – a, a pick play, which if you watch any NFL, they'd run that play at least five or six times a game. Um, they run that in college all the time. So, what, what what were your thoughts on that? What was what did Brian Brian Kelly say after the game? Was he like saying this is this is a disgrace or this is a joke? Was he completely mad at the officials or what was it like? Well, I think Coach Kelly didn't really have to say much. You know, like he he knew, I and mean, he he actually came in and said he was proud of us, and and he said, you know, I couldn't have asked you know, for you guys to play a better game. And he really handled it well. Um, but, man, I remember, you know, I remember going to some of the guys after the game. I remember, uh, I remember, you know, seeing my parents after the game. Uh, me and Joe walked out together, and we were both in tears. And, and uh, our parents, um, their, their family is kind of like my second family. They're like my, they're my adopted, uh, long-lost, mother and father from California, and I remember hugging, you know, Deb Schmidt and just saying, man, they stole that game from us. They stole it. You know, we had that game. That was that was our game, and and so, whatever. I'm kind of going Uncle Rico uh, right now. But, <laughs> yeah, I got you. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 yeah, yeah, that was, uh, that was one of those. I, I don't think, actually, that that was, like, what set us back the rest of the year or anything like that. I mean, okay. um, again, I think that was more the injuries and, and Joe being one of those one of the biggest ones, but uh, yeah, we were injury plagued that year, and uh, and so, but we had a man, we had a great football team, and we had guys that could play, and we had the belief level on that team at that at that time was was I mean it was it was really high, man. Um, we uh, it it really looked a lot to me like that 2012 team, and so. Um, I was really confident, obviously, as a captain and what my team was able to do and um, what we were able to do as a unit. I really felt like we had the guys to make it happen. It just, you know, that's the game of football, you know. That's the, that's how a season works, and you just never know. I mean, you never know. I mean, even like tomorrow, like we're talking about undefeated seasons, but and I'm not, like I'm going to speak life over our team right now and just, Plead the blood of Jesus over and protection over all of our guys. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but but yeah, just uh, um, it was a uh, it was awesome uh, going back to that season. It was a special time for me as a senior, and um, and that was a hard that was a hard moment in 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 my career. But that's just again that's how the game of football works, and sometimes the chips don't fall your way. Yeah, I I really appreciate you being humble. I'm gonna kind of speak from the other side. I never. Being a baseball player, you never want to say the umpire lost the game for you or balls and strikes or even in football, um, say penalties or blame games on the ref. But those, both you guys that season were completely even. It, that was the last play of the game. They hadn't called it the whole year. And that, that, that official literally determined the outcome of the game right there. I know that um, – I personally, I know you don't want to either yeah. blame any game on the officials. But when two teams are that even and you're on the road and you make that great of a play, to just take it away from you guys like that was just – um, it was awful, and I hope uh, when Florida State – I'll be at the game here in a couple of weeks. Florida State comes to South Bend. I hope that we run the score up on them uh, as much as we can. I mean, obviously, Kelly's not going to score 100 points on them, but I hope we try to score as many points as we can, and I hope that we start uh, – the students start mocking with the tomahawk chop once we get a big lead. And Michael, you're ruthless, man. You're ruthless. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, a uh, few more questions. A uh, few more questions before I get off here for you. Um Okay, you know I have to touch on it. If you guys are listening to this, you probably have seen the photo by now. Uh, I think it was the Notre Dame USC game, the um, photogenic picture that kind of went. Uh, what do you call it? When went viral across the country. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what your uh, week was like when that came out? Man, that's a that's a funny situation, man. It's just one of those moments in time where you're just like, wow, 
like, really? That happened? That happened to me? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, that's all you can really do because it was just such a, such a comical, you know, freak accident of a, I mean, not even, I guess, not an accident necessarily. Yeah. Um, just the timing, the timing was just impeccable. <laughs> and, um, you know, I've, I've been, I've talked about this time and time again. So, you know, people have probably heard, but I'll just kind of, I will, uh, you know, I'll kind of go over, you know, my thought process throughout the whole thing, but, you know, just for everybody that, you know, if you haven't heard and you've seen the picture and you thought, what the heck is that thing Photoshopped? Is that real? <laughs> like, it is real. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I was one of the first skeptics. You know, I was like, man, that does not seem real. I actually thought somebody maybe photoshopped my head on it. But then I saw the, the pictures from multiple angles and, like, saw the film. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's legit. Um, but, but yeah, my thought process was actually, I don't know if you guys, even you are referring about that Purdue game earlier. Um, man, my helmet came off during that Purdue game earlier in the season. And uh, I, I got 11 stitches in my head at halftime. Um, not a lot of people know about that, wow. but, uh, <laughs> I actually, I was just, I remember my thought process when my helmet came off because it had happened so many times, uh, that season already. I think it happened three or four times already, not including practice. I have a, I have a, I have a smaller head. Like I have a medium helmet and like, there's usually only like one or two guys on the team that have a medium helmet. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I had a medium helmet and, I don't know what the heck, you know, happened, but, you know, it just popped right off. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, my goodness, like, not again. Kind of like a, you know, uh, almost like rolling your eyes moment. And, you know, it just so happened that, you know, when he, you know, snapped that photo, I was just, it was the beginning of me just kind of almost like side smirking and like, wow, that, that happened again. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and, um, you know, because they were pretty much blowing the whistle dead probably about that time. And so people are like, well, you're running through all these people. And how, like, how did you have that face or whatever? Yeah. And, and you know, that's kind of the explanation <laughs> that I have. I, yeah. I, I, I wasn't fearful or anything like that after the helmet or after the whistle was blown. And, and so, um, so yeah, then the next, uh, I really, it, it didn't take off though until that Monday. So that, that following Sunday, you know, I think it was starting to build a little bit of momentum, but like yeah. I didn't really, I wasn't looking at social media or anything on Sundays. I usually, I take Sundays, you know, Sundays were my day at college, especially to just turn things off. Because Absolutely. Yep. Everything is just so, so hectic. And the funny, the funny thing is, is I don't know if you've heard this, but I've, I've talked about this on a few other occasions. Um, but the funny thing is, is that night, only by coincidence, I guess, <laughs> if you want to call it coincidence, me, my fiance at the time, who's now my wife, and then a couple of my friends were in, uh, in my, uh, at my house and we were watching Zoolander. And, uh, <laughs> and then the <laughs> next morning I see my social media, my social media just blew up and, um, and I was getting calls from news, news stations. The Today <laughs> Show was calling me. Um, all these different people were calling my, like my parents were calling me and saying, Hey, all these news anchors are calling our house. And what are, what are we supposed to do about this? And, uh, and the hashtags all over the place were blue steel. <laughs> <laughs> That's and a great I, movie. Great movie. I, I, yeah, man, it's crazy. And even crazier than that, I had blue a friend steel. that called me who, um, I had a friend that called me earlier that week, a couple nights before the game, and he said, hey, I was praying for you, and I felt like, I, I just felt this, I felt like, I felt like I was supposed to tell you that this week, something crazy is about to happen, and you're going to be put on this national stage. I kid you not, I swear to you, like, this happened. And I was like, I didn't really think anything of it, I, like, I hadn't heard from this guy in a really long time, yeah. and for him to just randomly out out of the blue call me and say that was just nuts but but yeah man that that actually happened all that stuff is true like um <laughs> and it's just a crazy time in my life that i still look back at it and i'm like okay lord like i don't know what you were doing there but um i guess we just continue to see so 
Yeah, man, that that's that was that's a crazy story you have there. The uh, I love the Blue Steel Zoolander reference. That that's a, that's a hilarious movie. I can just that's probably what comes comes to mind when I saw that too. He just staring down, staring down in that movie. That's hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. there's it's, another it's a funny picture. I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. I've seen it a couple times. Um, you might not know what I'm talking about, but there's a, a GIF on, out there on social media of a running back running through uh, the cones or those those pads that try to help you from fumbling the ball in practice, and he just gets completely stopped. Like he's going oh, the opposite. Yeah. Was that you yeah. or is that somebody else? Oh, that's me, man. That's you. Yeah, that's my, two, <laughs> my, two, oh. my, my two moments. <laughs> my two moments of fame in Notre Dame are funny gifs. <laughs> so yeah, my my definitely the yeah that was that was funny. That was in uh, training. That was in training camp going into my senior year, and uh, I was I was at the front of the running back line, obviously. Yeah. And um, coach Coach <laughs> Alfred actually wasn't there, uh, but Coach Kelly was. He was our position coach while Coach Alfred was gone. He actually was uh, he was away because his brother had passed away. Um, just suddenly, and um, Coach Kelly was there, and he was he was running the running back drills, and uh, and they set this blaster up, and you know we it was man it was two a days it was the middle of training camp yeah. I wasn't thinking twice about I mean every blaster <laughs> I've ever ran through in my life are usually tires yeah and you go both ways like uh-huh. what you do like in the drill usually is you run through it and then you they, they have you stick your foot in the ground and then come back through it the other way yeah so anyway we got this brand new fancy blaster and our <laughs> our equipment guys set it up shout out to Ryan Grooms Ryan if you're listening out there love you man still I've forgiven you um they set this they set this blaster up and and it was just a one-way blaster, I guess. And so, you know, I went up to that thing expecting <laughs> to, expecting to, you know, run through it and then run back. And man, I got access denied. <laughs> so hard. So pretty sure, pretty sure I probably cracked my rib um, during that time, and you know, never said anything about it. But uh, it's all good, all good these days. But definitely a funny. <laughs> Yeah, definitely a funny gif to look at. For <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah, I've seen that several times. I've seen put people put on their uh, Monday has me like dot 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 and that gif and stuff, man. So, yeah, oh, you've been you've been a part of uh, several uh, several pictures and uh, gifs out there. Hey, before I let you go, a few um, final questions. Um, last two questions I got for you, you can can tackle them uh, together. How was your time in the Canadian Football League? And then also um, as a parting question, uh, what's your thoughts on this year's team? Sure. Well, um, Canadian Football League was was awesome. I mean, it's uh, I mean, interesting, interesting and awesome at the same time. It's definitely a it's a different sport, man. It's I mean, it's football, but it's still it's different. You know, there's 12 people on the field. There's different rules. Uh, the field's longer. Uh, it's wider. Um, the field goal posts are at the front of the end zone, so the back of the end zone. You know, there's no fair catches on punt, and you get a five-yard halo around the returner, so there's always a return no matter what. Um, as a receiver, you get, you know, a running start at the head, at the, at the line of scrimmage sometimes, which isn't as advantageous as people, like, think it is. Like, everybody's like, wow, if that, was, that just seems like such an advantage for the receiver. And, and it really, like, it actually isn't because you have to, like, make sure you're on side still and – you have to, you know, you always have to be cognizant of a guy that's going to spin down in the coverage and take your head off while you're trying to look and see if you're on side. So, yeah, yeah. So it's a, uh, it's a really intense, intense game. It's a fun game to watch. It's got, I think it's got really like cool rules. Um, as a running back, it was kind of frustrating sometimes to only have three downs instead of four because you know you just didn't. There wasn't a lot of running the football, but I was, you know, I'm kind of a two-way player anyway. I was a running back and receiver while I was up there. I actually, I, I uh, slimmed down a little bit to go play up there. I was about 190 while I was playing up there, and when I was playing at Notre Dame, I was usually around 205. So, um, I, it's just, it's, it was a different game, and it was fun, man. I got to, got to be a part of a really special team last year in Toronto, which was incredible. We won a Grey Cup. And I got a, I mean, I got a ring. It was awesome. That's sweet. Yeah. It was a, it was a blast. Uh, 
So, hey, uh, really fun times. Uh, hey, don't mean to, don't mean to interrupt, but I guess uh, Instagram Live only lets me go for an hour. That's what I'm going on right now. Yeah. So, um, I'll wrap yeah. up or I'll wrap it up real quick right here. If um, uh, I think it's about it's got counting me down to 16 minutes, so I guess Instagram Live's only got me for an hour. So, um, just stay on the phone for yep. a second. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna kind of close out on here. Thanks for watching, guys. Um, Joe Joe Schmidt. Hopefully, we'll have him on here in the future. But that was Cam McDaniel, probably one of the best interviews I've ever had. Thanks for watching, guys.